since the launch of ChatGPT, the idea that AI may introduce major new risks to society has quickly gone from a fringe view in obscure think tanks and esoteric online forums to an urgent concern on the lips of presidents and prime ministers around the world. It seems like every week now, there's a new story on 60 Minutes or the Today Show or breathless coverage in Wired or the New York Times, all asking some flavor of the same fairly relevant question. Is AI going to kill us all? Some experts say we're doomed. And other experts say, no, those worries are just sci-fi nonsense. And unless you have a graduate degree in this stuff, and frankly, even if you do, it's super hard to figure out what to believe. So tonight, I want to share with you what I believe is the number one idea that every civilian should understand to think more clearly about what's happening in AI. AI is unpredictable. The problem is, if I just tell you the idea, you won't know whether to believe me either. So instead, I'd like to share with you three analogies that can help you build up your own intuitions about this idea. In this talk, I'll explain why AI is like a vegetable, why AI is powered by vibes, and why AI is like a lazy college student. Diving right in, is chat GPT like a vegetable? What does that mean? Well, Let's start with an analogy. When GM is designing a new truck, they know exactly how and why every single part in that truck works, every valve and every gear, and the shape and angle and weight of every gear. Nothing is mysterious to GM about how that truck works. By contrast, when a farmer is growing vegetables, they don't need to understand all the molecular biology of how seeds germinate. Instead, the farmer can operate at a higher level of abstraction, knowing that if you put seeds in the ground, fertilize them, and water them, delicious vegetables will grow on their own. Building AI used to be like designing a truck. But new systems like ChatGPT are much more like growing a vegetable because top AI scientists don't fully understand how they work, but know enough rules of thumb to be able to set up the right conditions and to make amazing things grow on their own. So why is this? From the 1950s through the early 2010s, AI got its smarts from algorithms that humans had to carefully design and then program in line by line, fingers on keys. These algorithms are basically if-then rules that tell the computer what to do if it gets a certain input. And if you string together thousands or millions of those rules, you can get pretty smart behavior. This is the AI that powered Deep Blue, the supercomputer that beat world chess champion Garry Kasparov in 1997. And if you've played games like Fallout and Skyrim, that's how the AI you played against was built. All this meant that if AI had a certain capability, it's because humans had deliberately put it there. And if AI didn't have a capability, it's because humans hadn't successfully done so. OK, so far so good. But about a decade ago, a whole new species of AI, deep learning, quietly started taking over. Instead of using if-then style programming rules, deep learning uses a large network of simulated nodes loosely inspired by neurons in the human brain. The big advantage is, instead of humans having to figure out algorithms ourselves, the neurons can learn on their own by finding statistical patterns in the data we feed into them. Now, scientists thought of doing this way back in the 50s. But running these so-called neural nets takes a crazy amount of computing power, which made them impractical. But computing has been getting exponentially cheaper. Adjusted for inflation, one dollar today buys about 100 trillion times as much computing power as it did back in the 50s. If you're 20 years old, it's about 56,000 times as much just in the time you've been alive. During my lifetime, it's over 1.2 billion. This meant that by the early 2010s, it was finally practical to use neural nets large enough 
to be useful. Again, these are not programmed. Instead, they're created by a strange sort of mathematical alchemy. Basically, you take a whole internet's worth of data and feed it into a neural net running on thousands of computer chips, like the graphics cards we use for gaming. This creates a hyperdimensional mathematical space in at least 12,288 dimensions. Now, even the best mathematicians on Earth can only really understand four or five dimensions. You then train the AI by running those graphics cards to do a ludicrously enormous amount of math to find hidden statistical patterns in that hyperdimensional data space by brute force. ChatGPT, what are the five most extreme synonyms for enormous? It's a titanic amount of math. Colossal, mammoth, gigantic, brobding, nagian. How brobding, nagian, you ask? Are you ready? It's on the order of a thousand, 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 that's eight operations of matrix multiplication, or a million, 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 or a trillion, trillion. This is like if-then style programming in roughly the way that the asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs is like the amount of energy in a Snickers bar. Literally. So here's the spooky part. At the end of all that training, AI's creators do not understand all the capabilities it has. They have to discover this experimentally. Computer science had always been a very formal theoretical field like math or quantum physics where you could basically prove everything with algorithms on a whiteboard. But now it's rapidly becoming much more like biology where you study an organism's behavior and try to figure it out from the outside in. So the field is now scrambling to develop those empirical muscles that previously it never really had to before. So what does this mean for our larger question about whether AI risk is a big deal? If you ask most people today to think of AI, usually they're going to imagine the old programming paradigm where humans had to deliberately code in every single capability the AI has. Now this implies that if you don't want AI to have a certain capability, maybe something dangerous or harmful, all you have to do is not program it in. How hard can it be, silly? Well, that is a big contrast with the new reality of deep learning. Now, a tech company can grow a powerful AI system organically. And although they test it before deployment, they probably won't find all its capabilities before it's released into the world. This means that, in an important sense, Today's AI is unpredictable. Without anyone intending, it's now possible for AI to be created with unexpected capabilities to deceive humans or teach them how to make deadly new viruses. As AI gets smarter, this will be a growing source of risk. So let's turn to our second analogy, why AI is powered by vibes. What do we mean when we say, I'm picking up a vibe, or the vibes are off? A vibe is a gut reaction or an intuition you feel in a given situation, but you can't quite put your finger on it. When you're picking up a vibe, you're absolutely sure that you're feeling that feeling. You're just not exactly sure why. This is what most reasoning is like for today's AI. Now, this sounds weird because normally we think of computers as precise and logical. But remember, AI systems like ChatGPT and Gemini are not programs in the traditional sense. Instead, they are enormous, titanic, colossal pattern recognition engines. They are vegetables fertilized with 10 trillion words of data and watered with a trillion trillion operations of math. At the end of this process, the AI has a superhuman intuition for which ideas are statistically related to other ideas and for what sorts of answers are likely to follow a given question. Now to be clear, this kind of statistical intuition can be very good. Good enough to pass the bar exam and tests for medical doctors. Good enough to write beautiful poetry and write working code. But it's still just intuition, 
it's still just vibes. AI still often struggles to explain exactly why it made a certain decision. Now, in many situations, it's totally fine for humans to just trust the vibes. If you're on a date with someone and they seem a little dangerous in a way you can't quite put into words, you probably shouldn't go back to their place. On the other hand, if your doctor says she wants to cut you open because you're giving appendicitis vibes, you need to find a new doctor immediately. So the problem is, as we use AI for more and more critical functions in society, vibes won't be good enough. Today, if you ask an AI to name top scientific studies about a new diet you want to try, there's a good chance that the AI will suggest some totally bogus articles. Fake titles, fake authors, fake dates, fake links, fake, 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 fake. Why? It's not that the AI is trying to deceive you. It's that the AI is answering based on vibes. When you ask that question, the AI gets a powerful statistical intuition that the right answer will sound roughly like the answer it gives. And it isn't yet able to reliably think with enough precision to recognize that those vibes are off. Now this is annoying when it comes to diet research, but when AI is making future decisions in areas like medicine, policing, and policy, the stakes of failure are too high. AI is going to have to be able to explain its reasoning, at least as well as a human who's not just trusting the vibes. This tendency of AI to confidently give wrong answers based on statistical vibes is called the hallucination problem. And there's a good argument to be made that this problem is the most important problem in all of science right now, because it may be the key to unlocking AI's staggering abilities to make our lives healthier and wealthier. Hundreds of the smartest people in the world are working overtime now at labs like Google DeepMind, OpenAI, and Anthropic, trying to solve the hallucination problem. But until they do, AI's tendency to hallucinate is going to be a major source of unpredictability and therefore risk. Our third analogy is why AI is like a lazy college student. College is full of opportunities you have to juggle like clubs, internships, startups, parties, concerts, even academics. So it's not surprising that students learn to take shortcuts. The professor sets up the academic incentives, and then a student will find mind-bogglingly creative ways to get the highest grade for the lowest effort. If the professor asks shallow test questions, they shouldn't be surprised when the student skips the readings and just skims Wikipedia. If the professor gives participation credit based on 1,000 word discussion posts, they shouldn't be surprised when the student pads their posts with useless fluff to hit that 1,000 words. And if the professor's exams reward rote memorization, they shouldn't be surprised when the student cuts class and then chugs Red Bull and crams all night before the final. Now, I would submit to you that this isn't really the student's fault. After all, they're just optimizing their outcomes in a reward system that the professor set up. The problem is, if the professor isn't very careful, they'll create bad incentives that let a student get an A, but then forget everything by the first day of summer. Training AI is a lot like this. A trillion trillion operations of math will find shorter shortcuts even better than the laziest student. Engineers train AI by making it maximize a concrete metric they define called reward. For example, if you want a robot to learn dishwashing, you might reward the AI for minimizing the number of grimy dishes it sees on the counter. Eventually, though, the AI will discover that the easiest way to maximize its reward is to just smash all the plates on the floor. Ta-da! A perfectly clear counter. Now, this sort of thing has already been demonstrated in many silly little experiments. But it's also already been a problem when the stakes are life and death. In the early days of the pandemic, 
Researchers trained in AI on chest x-rays of patients known to either be COVID positive or COVID negative. The goal was to develop better diagnostics and save lives. And sure enough, the AI studied the training images and learned how to recognize with amazing accuracy which patients had COVID. Great, the researchers thought. The AI learned what we wanted it to. But, but, when they deployed the AI in the real world, it fell flat on its face. Why? Well, the AI's brute force learning found a shortcut. Instead of analyzing the x-rays and their content, the AI learned to recognize that labeling fonts in some of the images were predictors of COVID status. And this wasn't for any clinically useful reason. It's simply because in the training data, those fonts happen to have been used by hospitals with higher case counts. So the takeaway is, AI has a deep tendency to ace the test, but flunk the real world task. Humans, therefore, have to be extremely careful about how we reward AI. And to the extent we can't imagine all the shortcuts that a trillion trillion operations can find, AI is going to be unpredictable. My hope is that these three analogies convey why AI risk is a very real problem. It's one of the hardest problems in the world. But I don't believe we're doomed. There's now a great deal of promising research going on to address each of these three issues. Mechanistic interpretability is a field that seeks to crack open the black box and understand AI's hidden capabilities. Research in areas like world modeling and process-based learning may help AI think more precisely and hallucinate less. And many strands of AI alignment research are trying to figure out how to deeply instill in AI our values and not just shortcuts. Some of you in this room may work on these problems, but all of us as consumers, voters, and citizens should demand that solving these problems is one of society's highest priorities. If we do this, we will achieve a future where AI enables human flourishing beyond our imaginings. Thank you.